thank you for joining us. I'll give everyone a couple more minutes to, to log on. It looks like our attendee list is growing as, as folks are jumping on. Um, first, I wanna welcome you to this uh, July 15th uh, webinar for the Michigan Hymns chapter. We're so excited to have you here as part of this. Uh, quick reminder that today's session is being recorded and will be, then be uploaded to our Michigan Hymns uh, YouTube channel. So if you haven't checked that out before, please do so. There's lots of great content there. Um, and with that, I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, today's uh, webinar lead, Dr. Stalberg. Um, she completed her medical school and residency training in obstet obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Michigan. She attained a Master of Arts in Higher Ed and Post-Secondary Education from the School of Education at U of M in 2006. And her, her academic interest is the pedagogy of teaching and training others to teach as well as online education. She has a longstanding online course on both the Coursera and Future Learn platforms. Dr. Stalberg is involved in medical ed across the continuum of undergraduate and graduate medical training. She also maintains a busy clinical practice in general obstetrics and gynecology. gynecology. Nationally, Dr. Stalberg serves on a number of committees for the National Board of Medical Examiners and the American Association of Medical Colleges. So thank you so much for joining us and I will kick it over to Dr. Stalberg. Thank you. Thanks. Um, very nice to uh, meet everyone. It's, sorry that we're virtual. Um, those uh, introductions are always quite humbling because I just sort of feel like, you know, just do me. I'm uh, the nice Karen, if you will. Um, I also want to make sure that uh, I give a shout out to my colleague, Dr. Gretchen Pyatt, who is the Associate Chair of Education in the Department of Learning Health Sciences as well as the graduate chair for our health infrastructures and learning uh, systems degree program uh, and just a really great colleague and uh, focuses on uh, diabetes and uh, care practices. Um, before we get started, uh, Gretchen, did you want to add any hellos or anything? Just hello to everyone. I'm happy to be here and um, you know Hims is an organization that uh, we hold in very high regard, uh, and one in which our um, uh, students in our academic programs uh, are very much interested in. So happy to be here and happy to answer any questions as they come up. Yeah, wonderful. So in this very strange, weird meta world that we're in on these screens, um, we actually are going to take the opportunity to uh, show you a video of a webinar that we did a little bit ago earlier in the spring uh, as a sort of background for what we, we can do with our health uh, degree, as well as how we think about uh, health infrastructures, learning systems, uh, how we can improve care by um, engaging data and stakeholders and thinking about ways to change. So uh, I'm going to disappear for a minute, although we won't really because you'll see this video. So, uh, but we, um, there are some questions and answers embedded in the video and we will be able to take your questions uh, as soon as the video is completed. It's a bit of a long webinar, uh, but we're still gonna be here. So uh, if you have any questions, you can throw them in the chat, uh, but we'll definitely uh, be back shortly. So thank you very much for being here and for um, your attention. And let's see if I can get this right. Hello and welcome. My name is Emily Reich. I'm a design manager at the Center for Academic Innovation. Thank you for joining us today for a second Michigan Online Visionary Educators event. The MOVE series is hosted by the Center for Academic Innovation at the University of Michigan. An important part of our mission is to create a more inclusive and global learning community. We believe an informed, peaceful, and equitable society is dependent on learners everywhere adopting a learning lifestyle. This monthly fe series features experts sharing insights, tools, and discussions on issues relevant to the lives of people around the world. 
Many of the speakers may be familiar to you as they are the faculty behind some of our most successful and innovative learning experiences available through Michigan Online. For more information on our upcoming MOVE series events, be sure to check out the schedule at online.umich.edu forward slash MOVE. For today's event, we invite you to submit questions for our panelists using the Q&A function, and they will do their best to answer as many questions as they can. Additionally, we want you to know that today's event will be recorded. The recording will be made available on the Michigan Online website. We will also send the recording to all attendees after the event. For today's topic, Staying Alive, Learning Health Systems and the Race Against the Clock, I am joined by faculty and staff from the University of Michigan Health Infrastructures and Learning Systems Program to explore the real world problem of out of hospital cardiac arrest as a mechanism for understanding the concept of a learning health system. I'm excited to introduce Charles Friedman, who is the Josiah Macy Jr. Professor of Medi Medical Education, the Chair of the Department of Learning Health Sciences and a Professor of Learning Health Sciences. I'm also joined by Karen Stahlberg, Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology and Associate Professor of Learning Health Sciences. Gretchen Payat, Associate Chair of Educational Programs, Associate Professor of Learning Health Sciences, Associate Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education within the Medical School and School of Public Health. And last but not least, Emily Coulter Thompson, Department Strategist within the Department of Learning Health Sciences is joining us as she is stepping in for Michelle Williams, who is unable to join us today. Charles, Karen, Gretchen, and Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Um, first rule of webinars is unmute, right? Uh, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to uh, bring up the slides for us all. And um, let me make sure that I am sharing the screen. Of course, nerves when you have people all over watching and uh, learning from us. So we're really glad that everybody can be here with us today to think about uh, what it means to be a learning health system and how that can be applied to really sticky and, and wicked problems that we have in healthcare. Uh, we've already gotten the introductions out of the way, if you will. And so I wanted to just share quickly what we're going to try to accomplish during our session today. So we want to make sure that uh, we're clear in explaining so that you can understand the concept of a learning health system, particularly applied to the real world problem of out of hospital cardiac arrest. We want to learn about how learning health systems can actually help and improve and address this really important uh, problem. And then talk about ways that you yourself might be able to develop skills or competencies or capabilities within a learning health system. So I need to sort of set the stage here about how intense and scary a, a, a true cardiac arrest can be. And so I want you to think for just a moment, you're at the gym, you're walking down the street, you're in, the, in, the, in school, and someone just passes out. Somebody's heart has stopped beating. What are we supposed to do? How do we help that person? So I'm going to show a video that actually has real life uh, audio and video of an out of hospital cardiac arrest. First things to recognize is that everyone depicted in the um, video is A-OK. -okay. But I, we want to use it to give you a sense of what this challenge is when someone has an out of hospital cardiac arrest. Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. I, I'm going to help you, okay? okay? Just help us out the way. One, two, quicker, Bob. Three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Twelve, thirty, forty. You don't get over. I was in the bedroom getting ready to go bowling and stuff, and I just heard an unusual noise. And I just popped my head up, and she was hunched over the couch. And 911, that's all I could think of. 911, what's going on? What's happening? And the guy on the other side of the line just calm down, tell me what's going on, you know, what's happening. 
and uh, he kept telling me, we're on our way, you're doing fine. So pretty dramatic. Um, and the numbers actually support that. So I want to uh, make the distinction between out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, which is due to an electrical problem within the heart where someone's heart completely stops beating. And in the United States, that happens a, a very large number, right? 356,000 times. But what's even more scary is that only 10% of people who have that event survive. That means that nine out of 10 times, someone dies from out of hospital cardiac arrest. Now, the other thing that we think about when we think about heart disease are heart attacks. And a heart attack is a circulation problem, right? The pump has, has stopped working because um, the blood flow is blocked. So while you can have a resulting electrical problem in the heart from a blocked circulation, uh, from a heart attack, you can see that the survival numbers are actually higher uh, for heart attack. And so we really wanted to look at this issue of cardiac arrest where there's an electrical problem and the heart stops beating. So I'm gonna turn this over to our colleague, Emily Coulter Thompson, uh, to take the next part of the discussion from here. Thanks, Karen. Can you all see me? All right. Well, so now you know how serious the problem of cardiac arrest is. And I wanna commend Bobby Grams. He did everything right in helping to save the life of his wife, Karen Grams. And I wanna thank both of them for sharing their story so generously with us. And you see here the team of, of first responders who helped, the 911 dispatcher and the paramedic. And in cardiac arrest cases, it real, survival depends upon everyone working together seamlessly and in a timely way um, to help the victim survive. And fortunately, Karen today is thriving and she is an active member of our out of hospital cardiac arrest learning community. Karen and Bobby have shared their story with us and helped inspire these efforts that moved people in Southeast Michigan to want to increase and improve the system of care for cardiac arrest in our region. So about three years ago, people from the Department of Emergency Medicine at University of Michigan approached the Department of Learning Health Sciences wanting help to address this critical problem of cardiac arrest. They'd been working for years to improve the system of care, and still the survival rates were hovering at six to eight percent, which is lower than the national average of eight percent survival. So we decided together to try applying this innovative model of learning health systems to address the wicked problem and to try to improve the system of care in Southeast Michigan. Next slide, please. One hallmark of a learning health system is to engage multiple stakeholders and to involve those who know the system the best. And the American Heart Association has this model of the chain of survival that you see here. It shows how survival depends upon every part of the link in the chain working together seamlessly and in the most timely way, starting with bystanders or friends and family members recognizing the cardiac arrest and calling 911 like Bobby Grams, doing hands-only CPR, using a defibrillator and working closely with the paramedics and first responders, people at the hospital and people who support the whole recovery system to ensure the optimal care to ensure survival. And our very first step, next slide please, and forming a, a learning community was bringing together multiple stakeholders across this chain of survival. So we invited survivors, including Karen and Bobby Grams. We invited first responders, paramedics, law enforcement, firefighters, social workers, community educators, physicians, nurses, and getting everybody together. It was very exciting because there was energy and enthusiasm palpable in the room and a strong passion for wanting to address this critical problem. And even the act of bringing people together in the learning community immediately uh, showed me how the power of a learning health system works because 
when people started to talk and share their experiences, you could see that people were gaining a better understanding of each other's roles and the opportunities for optimizing the system. So we formed this learning community in October of 2018. And ever since we've been meeting quarterly as a large group and holding monthly work group meetings and trying to um, optimize the system of care for cardiac arrest. Next slide, please. We're utilizing this learning health system learning cycle model. And you can see in the center, the goal is to improve cardiac arrest survival. And specifically, we've, we've identified as a group the goal of optimizing the time to first treatment or the time for people to get CPR in the event of cardiac arrest. One of the first steps in, in the learning health system approach is to form a learning community that you can see in the lower right corner. And we have been describing the current state of the system, that green area, green arrow at the bottom, performance to data, and utilizing existing data that we have from the cardiac arrest registry, but also collecting new data, like conducting a community survey of bystanders' attitudes toward CPR. We're analyzing that data and seeing what we can learn. And the knowledge that we gain from the data it, we're using that to inform priorities and to select interventions that we can pilot test and implement. So looking at the, the analyze the blue arrow on the right data to knowledge, I'm sorry, on the left, and then the red arrow on the right, implementing, bringing that knowledge to performance. And once we pilot test interventions, we'll once again go to the describe phase to, to measure how the current system is working. And we'll continue to iterate around this learning cycle until we ultimately reach our goal. Forming a learning community is one step in a learning health system approach. But to tell you more about the approach and why we chose it, I'll turn it over to Dr. Charles Friedman. Thank you uh, so much, Emily. Next slide, please. So, why is this idea of learning health systems uh, so important and so interesting and so applicable to a problem like uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? So there were three reasons, at least, given on this slide. First, learning health systems are designed to address the tough problems. And I think, as you've heard uh, from Karen and Emily, this is a tough problem. Learning health systems also are designed to address system problems, system problems that need system solutions. Most problems in, in healthcare and out of hospital cardiac arrests are no exception, are system problems. The problem is not the people. The problem is the way the people work together and the environment in which they work and a number of other factors that comprises the whole system of care. Learning health systems address system problems that need these kinds of system solutions. And finally, learning health systems can accelerate the connection between discovery and implementation. Without this approach, it can take as much as 17 years for new knowledge to find its way into practice to improve care. Out of hospital cardiac arrest cannot wait 17 years for a solution. So the learning health system approach is ideal for this problem. Next slide, please. A quick piece of history. Uh, the learning health system idea is about 14 years old. It was advanced by what was then called the US Institute of Medicine in 2007. And they defined the learning health system as an alignment of science, informatics, incentives, and culture for continuous improvement and innovation with best practices embedded in the delivery process and everybody involved, including patients and families. Next slide, please. So who is doing this? And the answer is many, many entities at many, many levels of scale. There are many single organizations in the US, single health systems that are on the pathway to becoming learning health systems. There are many networks, groups of organizations that have organized as learning health systems, usually focused on one particular disease area, but working together across these institutions to combine their efforts to make more rapid and effective progress. 
states, provinces, and regions, both in Canada and the United States, are becoming learning health systems within their own boundaries. Entire nations, Switzerland, the UK, Saudi Arabia, and the, the US through the Veterans Health Administration are becoming learning health systems at national scale. And there are those of us who envision a global learning health system someday, and perhaps a global learning health system would put us in a much better position to fight future pandemics, such as the one that we are living through now. Next slide, please. And here's why. And here's an example of how the learning health system can address very, very uh, challenging problems. Uh, you see here, and I think the curve tells the whole picture, what a group of uh, organizations have done, a, a system called Improve Care Now, uh, to, to improve the remission rate uh, for very serious inflammatory bowel disease uh, in young adults and adolescents uh, over a period of uh, 10 years. Uh, and But you see the improvement starting much sooner than that. Next slide, please. Emily has already mentioned this slide. This is the improvement cycle. It is what learning health systems do. The difference between the version of the slide I'm showing you now and the one Emily showed is that in the middle, it just says health problem of interest. This illustrates that learning health systems really can be applied to any problem we are talking about in this webinar, how it applies to out of hospital cardiac arrest, but any health problem can be addressed by learning health system methods. Next slide, please. A few things are unique about the learning health system approach. And the first, which I'll dwell on for just a moment because it has not been covered yet uh, by any of my colleagues, is this idea of infrastructure. And I'm talking about infrastructure because it, it figures prominently into the design of our HILLS educational program where the I in HILLS stands for infrastructure. A way to think about learning health systems is as a collection of these learning cycles operating at the same time, but each focused on its own health problem and uh, monitored and governed by its own learning community. It turns out that since it, each of these learning cycles is doing basically the same thing, the green uh, performance to data, the blue data to knowledge, and the red uh, knowledge to performance, these learning cycles share the activities they undertake, which means they can all share services provided by an infrastructure. This is kind of like a bridge to help trucks, cars, trains, pedestrians, and bicycles all get across a river as opposed to having everyone build their own boat to cross a river. So infrastructure is key to a learning health system. Next slide, please. The second unique feature of learning health systems is this idea of multi-stakeholder engagement. And here you see some additional pictures of the multi-stakeholder engagement evidence in our out-of-hospital cardiac arrest learning community. And the third, next slide please, and very important distinguishing feature of learning health systems is this notion of continuity. Many, many organizations, as you see on the right, uh, try to execute something that approximates these learning cycles, but each piece of the cycle, the green piece, the blue piece, and the red piece are undertaken by different groups, which means there are gaps at the necessity for handoffs in order for the cycle to work. But in the learning health system approach, the one learning community follows the, the entire cycle in its entirety, eliminating handoffs and eliminating gaps and this makes the process of improvement much more effective. Next slide, please. So this concludes my short remarks about what the learning health system in general is. And now I will turn this over to my colleague, Gretchen Pyatt, who will talk about the educational program hills that we have put in place uh, to support the growth and development and a workforce for learning health systems. Gretchen. Gretchen, you're on mute. Thank you, Emily. Uh, 
And, and thank you to Chuck. Um, so again, my name is Gretchen Pyatt. I'm the Associate Chair for Education in the Department of Learning Health Sciences. Um, and I also serve as the Graduate Chair of the Health Infrastructures and Learning Systems, or HILS, as we call it, MS and PhD programs. So as Chuck mentioned, uh, learning health systems work is very, very unique. And as such, we really do require a uniquely trained workforce. So thankfully, we anticipated this need back in 2015 when we developed the Hills Graduate Program. Hills is the first graduate program of its kind in the United States, and it truly is a very unique degree. It's one of the only degree programs that addresses the social and the technical challenges, as Chuck and Emily alluded to, that health systems face in making continuous health improvement an actual routine process. So one of our most defining features of Hills, and one that I myself am actually most proud of, is that we make it a point in Hills to train a very, very holistic student. And this is a student that is just as comfortable with information and informatics as they are with social science. And I oftentimes tell potential students that if they're interested in changing the health of populations, they should get a degree in public health. However, if they're interested in changing the health system, they belong in Hills because we will train them how to change the health system. Hill students use their diverse backgrounds and their new skills um, from the program to design, implement, and evaluate innovative change and continuous improvement in health. Next slide, please. Another distinguishing feature that makes Hill such a unique degree program is the diverse backgrounds of our students. So students come to us with backgrounds from a lot of different places, things like health professions, engineering, public health, informatics, and many, many others, but they have one common thread. They want to be able to fix the problems that they've addressed or that they've witnessed firsthand in the healthcare organizations where they've worked. I would say nine out of 10 students who I talk to and who come to Hills all have that very, very common um, thread. Next slide, please. And as the Hills curriculum is designed to address that, those challenges, um, an innovative curriculum that is actually intertwined with the learning health cycle is absolutely critical. So if you think back to the slides that Emily and Chuck presented that detail the learning, cycle, uh, the learning health cycle, as you could see here, we took that cycle and we developed courses that correspond with each segment. So we offer courses in research and evaluation, data science, informatics, health infrastructures, implementation science, and other ones as well. And when the courses come together, students walk away with training in the entire learning health cycle. And we feel that this really places our graduates in a very desirable uh, position to be able to affect health systems change. Next slide, please. So in Hills, we offer three degree options. We offer a residential PhD, which consists of 36 credit hours and a learning cycle project, which is similar to a practicum. Um, we also offer two options for master's degrees, both a residential and an online MS. And the really nice feature of the master's degrees that we offer is that Regardless of whether you choose to matriculate residentially or online, the curriculum and requirements are the same. So 27 credit hours and a learning cycle project that can all be completed in 12 months if you're full time. And I think it's important to note that Hills has had many successes over the past five years. You know, upwards of 15 students have been awarded grants and other accolades for their work, our faculty continues to grow and to become more diverse. 
and we graduated our first PhD students in 2020 who have all, all gone on to um, very, very important postdoctoral experiences. However, over the course of time that we've been offering Hills residential degrees, the need emerged to our to grow our MS offerings to include an online master's degree as well. So I'm going to turn over the program to Dr. Karen Stahlberg. She's the current director of Hills Online, and she's going to describe the online MS in more detail. Thanks so much. So hopefully up to this point, you've seen uh, healthcare problems that require unique solutions, a unique way of looking at solving those problems. It's sort of integrated, uh, systemic way of, of creating change. And then thinking about ways to develop your expertise or, or in people in your organization to actually move forward and become part of these learning health systems. And so as part of this degree program, we envision the ability for people to become leaders in their learning health systems, to become innovators and improvers using the, the content that they, uh, that they go through, to develop expertise in process and quality, and, and to think about ways to develop data or understand data, collect data, represent data, so that it's usable for all parties within the healthcare system, including patients and communities and providers. Uh, and so what's unique about our newest component of the Hills family, uh, as I like to think about it, is the online degree program. And, you know, we're here at the University of Michigan, where we have the um, luxury, in all honesty, of working with our colleagues on Mich with Michigan Online and the Center for Academic Innovation, to think about what is the next way to, to help people who may be working, who may already have uh, expertise in certain components of the learning health system to gain more information, to get a degree, but not have to leave their jobs, their families, their locations, but can come online into our community and learn together with all of us. So we wanted to make sure that we had a lot of time for discussion and questions because we know that we've introduced a number of new concepts today, not just the learning health system itself, but what all goes into the learning health system, as well as thinking about what would it mean for me to get an online degree from the University of Michigan? Because the thing that's important to remember is that Hills Online is a Michigan degree. And so students will leave here with the same degree that people um, in, the, in real life, right, in 3D, uh, get their uh, degree. The instructors are the same, the content is the same, the level of excellence is also the same. So we plan on um, asking questions, but as part of this slide deck, we're also going to include links and additional resources, not only to our department and the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest learning community, but also to the American Heart Association, uh, because we want people to, to be able to access resources so that they too can think about what happens if I'm in a situation where someone has a heart attack or when someone has a cardiac arrest. Uh, want to make sure that you are able to access all of the amazing things that our colleagues at Michigan Online uh, have created and continue to create. And then of course, ways that you can find us at the PhD and uh, master's program. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and ask my colleagues to come back on. And um, I think that Emily Reach is gonna help us go through the um, discussion questions. Thank you so much for being here and uh, for letting us you know, have this opportunity. Karen, I know you've got a couple of questions. Do you want to go ahead and um, read those off? Sure. Although, truth of the matter, Emily, um, I'm not sure I can see them right now. Okay. So if you could read them, that would be really helpful. I apologize. Okay. 
Give us just a minute. I do so see that like... a question just came into the chat too. Go ahead, Emily. Um, it just says, what are the total costs, including tuition for the entire program? Yeah, go ahead, Gretchen. So if, so if I could, um, it, it, I would need to clarify uh, the question. Um, uh, would it, I'm not sure whether the, the question is around the PhD program or the MS program. Um, all of the tuition uh, figures are, oh, I see the online MS, okay. Um, so uh, the total tuition is around $25,000 a year. Um, and obviously there's some differences of whether you're an in-state, you know, or out of state student. Um, but that's, that's roughly the, the amount. And, you know, we also, um, there are some possibilities for scholarship opportunities um, for the online MS. Wonderful. Um, so I know that there's a lot of questions uh, that we wanna make sure we get to, but um, I wanted to get the opportunity to expand a little bit on learning health systems and, and sort of how once a community of practice is created, how do you sustain that, right? How do we close that loop again? And so I was wondering if either Emily or Chuck could speak to, you know, once you've got a learning loop going, how does that continue to feed forward? What are the requirements? Sure, I can start and then Chuck, if you wanna add in. Um, one of the ways that we've sustained momentum with our out of hospital cardiac arrest learning community is that we've been very fortunate through a part partnership with emergency medicine and cardiology to receive grant funding from the American Heart Association to support community-based research. And what we've been doing that's been supporting our, our learning cycle work to evaluate the current state of the system. We've been listening to 911 phone calls and interviewing first responders and emergency professionals in Southeast Michigan to understand better what some of the the barriers and facilitators are to getting rapid time to getting time to first treatment in a faster way. And having that funding and sustainability, I think has helped generate interest and enthusiasm among the group because everybody who's in the learning community is interested in learning and, and discovering what we find from the data collection. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we'll all be taking those lessons and working together to choose interventions and priorities of how we can change our local system. Uh, thanks, Emily. I'd like to make two uh, additional points. One is money and the second is passion. So regarding money, uh, I, I did show a slide with many of the organizations that are investing in learning health systems and they are investing in learning health systems by putting resources into them and that translates into resources that support the kinds of activities uh, you, you all heard described as part of the learning cycle. The federal government's agencies are increasingly recognizing the value of learning health systems, and there are now funding opportunities available through several federal agencies for learning health system projects. So being very realistic, operating a learning cycle requires funding, but uh, in recognition of the potential and value of this approach, funding is increasingly becoming available uh, for, for these purposes. Second, passion. It's been extraordinary to watch our own learning community with out of hospital cardiac arrest and others that I have observed around the country generate their own momentum. It begins with passion around the problem and the tragedy of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and other diseases and the passion that that invokes in professionals and in families uh, to do something about this problem. And as progress is being made, the passion increases because people see what's possible. 
and the passion sort of feeds itself. And I've seen many, many examples of, for example, uh, in the group that's working on inflammatory bowel disease of uh, young adults who, after they themselves were helped, volunteering their time for the learning community to, to uh, increase the, the effort and parents of these people, in one case, a few cases, parents who have actually retired from their jobs to work full time in support of this effort. So uh, I think sustainability is supported by many things. I just wanted to speak to money and passion as two very important components of this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and finding new solutions, right? Uh, it is right instead of sort of saying oh we're kind of stuck <laughs> we don't know what to do really bringing people together and using uh the science if you will that is part of a learning health system uh to move things forward um allison brenner gretchen has a really great question about um the types and scope of learning cycle projects that our learners have done uh and the differences between sort of what our phd folks have done and our um, master's students? Sure. So this is a great question. Um, so the summer learning cycle project is around eight weeks in duration. Um, so, you know, the scope of it can't be really big um, because there's not a lot you could really finish up in eight weeks. However, we have had a variety of different types of uh, learning cycle projects that have actually been really well done. They've led to publications. Um, one of the one of the um, third year PhD students, um, he did a summer learning project a couple summers ago. He just got it accepted for publication, and that was um, uh, understanding how a decision aid for prostate cancer is implemented into a quality collaborative. Um, so that's an ex that's one example of the of the type of project that people do. Um, we have another student who uh, happens to work in perioperative services in the Michigan Medicine, and his summer learning project focused on um, uh, figuring out uh, how many sort of instruments were left in the cavity, uh, if hopefully none. But unfortunately, a lot of times instruments are left after an operation. Um, and, and his project was, was focused on, you know, why is that happening, the culture around that. Um, he also took that and he turned that into a PhD. Um, we have had other, we've had master students who've done um, work on social determinants of health. We actually had one master student who worked on the out of hospital cardiac arrest uh, project. And she was uh, implementing surveys around um, whether schools had access to AEDs. Um, and, and that, you know, that led to a really nice project where we were able to sort of get a lay of the land of these schools and, and see where services needed to um, be implemented. Yeah, thanks. Um, another little shout out plug, if you will, for automated uh, external defibrillators or AEDs, because that is yeah, really, you. Uh, you know, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, uh, the immediate availability of those is really critical for uh, cardiac arrest. Um, Christopher Herzog has another great question. Uh, I love great questions uh, about whether or not we include business classes in the Hills degree. Um, because these interventions require putting together business cases and showing the improvement in clinical care outcomes and resources. Uh, and so I'm going to just say that in uh, both master's programs, we have the opportunity for electives. Uh, and this would be a really interesting uh, possibility, which would be to include a business course per se. However, I'm going to ask Gretchen to really point out how things are, sorry, how um, making the case for uh, business models, as well as improving healthcare outcomes, how those links get created when you're within a learning health system. Yeah, so uh, I guess to reiterate what, what Karen said, 
so there there are the options for um, electives and some students do do take classes in the business school um, we've also had people take classes in public policy we have a student getting a a dual master's degree in public policy or, or public administration as well um, so in terms of though connecting I, i'm sorry what did you say karen connecting business to the learning health cycle actually improvement right so being able to show that whatever investment is made within yes. the healthcare system uh has a great return right and, yeah. and that return is evidenced by health yeah and I think another important part, and it's one that we didn't really, I didn't really get into when I when I talked about Hills, is that we also have an ethics and policy piece of the degree. Um, and a lot of the a lot of the the talk around business and improving and return on investment also um, plays a lot into policy work. And I would say if if you were to think about Hills and the buckets that we are really solid in it's like informatics implementation and ethics and policy um, so that's another that's another option um, to to connect those pieces of the puzzle um, with return on investment and sustainment and you know sustainability of these types of of um, interventions like out of hospital cardiac arrest. I mean, the, the biggest thing is that when out of hospital cardiac arrest, when that program, you know, is no longer run by the University of Michigan, that it continues to be sustained in those communities. And those communities continue to, to work on these problems and whatever problems are most meaningful to them. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, you know, it speaks to Chuck's point about infrastructure, right? About no matter what the health problem of interest is, is, is creating a workforce and a community where people understand the different components of the learning health cycle and have expertise um, is really, I think, where um, the benefit of getting a Hills degree comes from is because uh, it's this holistic view of, of what's needed. Um, and it's, uh, as, as Chuck has said to me, you know, agnostic around what the problem is. It's really a, a way of, of approaching a really big problem in healthcare and making structural changes that are based on data and information in an ethical way, including social sciences and implementation sciences to really um, make a difference. Um, yeah, Karen, so can I? I Please, please. Could, could, could I just add, because um, this is a very interesting question about the relationship of what m one might learn in a business program with what one might learn in Hills. And, and, and as this discussion has proceeded, I, I, I guess I'd like to make the point that there's a lot of the kind of thinking that is embedded in a program in management it, it, it into hills for example systems thinking for example uh measurement of outcomes and productivity to inform return on investment there's an old saying if you can't measure it you can't manage it one of the things you learn in hills is how to measure it so you can manage it so there are a number of connections, uh, although it is certainly not a program in business, uh, between the concepts uh, that one would encounter in a business program and the concepts that are baked into uh, the courses in Hills, or many of them at any rate. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's, um, you know, because it's such a new concept and a new program, um, it, it's really important for us to get out and, and have these conversations. So I just wanted to thank um, the folks at MOVE and the folks at uh, Michigan Online and Academic Innovation for helping uh, us present our information today and, and to really connect with, with all of you. Um, Emily Reich, I'm gonna kind of open it back to you, <laughs> um, if that's all right, uh, for any closing comments you might have and to, uh, you know, just thank everybody for participating in today's event.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Charles, Karen, Gretchen, and Emily, thank you so much. This has been some really incredible insight that you've provided us today. Um, and to our participants, thank you so much for following along, submitting your questions. You can check out upcoming move series, dates, times, and guests at online.umich.edu forward slash move. And if this topic was particularly interesting to you, I'd encourage you to take part in some of the courses we have online. They are listed here on your screen. There we go. The Hills program aims to improve the health of individuals and populations by developing researchers who design, implement, and evaluate innovative change and continuous improvement in health systems. You can learn more about the program by searching health infrastructures and learning systems on Michigan online or by click clicking the link that's provided in the chat in just a second. Thank you all for joining us today. We really hope you enjoyed this and uh, continue to join us for upcoming move events wonderful so i am going to stop that uh and um i know that there were some questions already in the chat uh gretchen did you happen to field some of those i think you did uh, there was one that asked about whether people can bring in outside interests and research ideas into the degree program if they wanted. And, and the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, most of our Hill students are working in a variety of different settings and they're usually working on projects that they're trying to figure out and get solutions around. So I would say that the majority of the Hill students are you know, they do use a project from their own um, work or, or interests for their summer learning project. Yeah, and that's what's um, so rich about this degree program, I think, is making sure that it's embedded in real world challenges and real world opportunities, right? So that, that's one of the really great reasons why you know, we wanted to connect with the Hims Michigan chapter is because a lot of what we do is uh, thinking about health information, health infrastructures, data, how data gets represented, shared, understood, collected. Um, so uh, we've done a lot of sort of presenting to you, both virtually and real. And so I want to uh, just pause here and um, take, you know, a minute for anybody else to jump in who might uh, want to ask additional questions or from our um, HIMSS colleagues to uh, sort of, you know, add perspective or additional information. Well, it looks like I think we did have, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Megan, I, I did have a question come in. How quickly can a learning health system operate? For example, learning APS, sharing how to deal with pandemics. I'm sorry. I, I can try to answer that. Um, the goal of the learning health system and the learning cycle that uh, particularly Chuck talked about in the video, the goal is for it to happen very quickly. And when the learning health system was developed, I think they mentioned this in the video, you know, the goal is really to take that that 17 year span of how long it takes to go from, you know, research uh, at the bench to, you know, it being applied in, in real world settings, you know, from 17 years to 17 months to 17 hours to 17 minutes. I think that that is the goal, although I don't know right now if it's extremely feasible, uh, just because there's so much more to learn about the learning health system. Mm -hmm. And this is why, you know, this is why we're training folks. I mean, there we need a dedicated workforce to do this type of work in order for learning health systems and learning health cycles to move at a more rapid pace. Yeah. Although, and I just um, put in the chat, you know, it, it sometimes it depends. So my colleagues um, in obstetrics and gynecology here at Michigan Medicine recognized that we were going to have a post-COVID baby boom. 
And so um, what we did through the uh, use of our health informatics team and with um, a, a, a basically a group within the medical center that uh, thinks about how can we use data to do research, did some modeling to predict uh, how many babies are going to be born this summer. And by uh, doing the modeling, we predicted that actually we were going to have a big boom. And last month, we did the highest number of deliveries in a month that we've ever done uh, at the University of Michigan. It was way over 500. And in anticipation of that baby boom, uh, leaders were actually to pros were prospectively able to um, find and create more places and spaces for our patients. So we've taken over 10 different additional rooms. We have additional staffing that has uh, occurred. We have different messaging that's gone out uh, to patients. And uh, we've had this surge really to of, of providers to help safely care for patients in it, it that we anticipated, right? Rather than reacting, uh, we anticipated. And so to me, this was a great, great example of how quickly we can turn a, a cycle if the infrastructure exists, right? If people who have a, a health systems lens can look at it in the right way. Uh, so um, Patty Cornish, I see, has a question which says, have you thought about the value of including care management with insurance companies regarding improved communication, data sharing, and care facilitation across the continuum of care of a medical event, i.e. cardiac arrest? Um, so I think the quick answer is yes. Uh, how that gets done uh, is a little bit more challenging. And, you know, I the challenge for me is I tend to live at the 10,000 foot view. So I can see all of these things that just make perfect sense, right? Like we should just all be doing this. Um, the realities though, obviously, and you all know better than I do, is that, right, each system, each organization has its own culture, has its own structure, has its own... Um, capabilities uh, in terms of how quickly it can move. And so uh, making sure that the right people are, are at the table for change and the right people are there to help understand solutions. Uh, and so uh, when we form this community of practice, the, the biggest, uh, the, sort of the, the most important step is making sure that everyone with a voice or a viewpoint or a, um, an opportunity to affect change is present at the table. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Just to um, piggyback on what Karen mentioned about the, the community of practice or the learning community, so to speak. Uh, we, that's the very first step that we tend to go to in the learning health cycle is creating that learning community and when we're thinking about creating a learning community, we're going through some processes in our heads anyway, about how to engage stakeholders and the right stakeholders. And, you know, the folks who are uh, interested and are influencers, uh, but also people who might not be interested, but are also influencers. Uh, so it's a, it's a, I don't know what the word is for it. It's a, it's a paradigm of who you would want to include in that learning community and making sure that they're engaged in meaningful ways. And, and that would be folks like care management um, and different members of insurance companies. Yeah, and I was gonna say a lot of these solutions are emergent, meaning so much like you have qualitative research that sort of comes together to to describe a phenomenon or describe a solution it's not that a community comes together to dictate what happens right in this case it should be about shared uh understanding and shared exploration of information shared meaning making because then that really is how things move forward right uh we're all um uh, we all kind of live in top-down organizations, <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of people who are doing, you know, the real world work who are like, well, this doesn't make any sense. And so that's, to me, the folks who really need to be at the table to help uh, make decisions. Uh, I noticed that somehow we have gotten to the one o'clock hour, uh, so I don't want to hold anybody up or prevent any, you know, time uh, crunches for folks. Uh, I really do want to thank um, the Hymns of Michigan chapter for the opportunity to uh, come before you. Obviously, we uh, are very happy to answer questions or connect 
uh, in any way. Um, I, I'm gonna, I think we should just close or does somebody from HIMSS wanna uh, close us out? No, I think that was great, Dr. Salworth and, and Gretchen and Dr. Pyatt. We so appreciate your time and energy on the topic. This has been a phenomenal discussion and took us all the way to the hour. So thank you again. And just a reminder that we will have this recording available on our HIMSS YouTube channel, along with other um, different webinars we've hosted in the past. And please check out our HIMSS webpage for upcoming uh, webinar uh, opportunities ahead through the summer and into the to the fall months. So thank you again. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon.